Hello everybody, Sean McMahon here. This is part 7 of our 1st Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 rapture study. And we are 7 layers deep here and no rapture to be found. What is going on here? Well, let's dive right back in. In the last part, we established that Paul never got to see the day of the Lord in his flesh. And we also were about to prove that he knew that this would be the case because Christ says so. So let's dive right back in here. Now, Christ said to all his apostles that they would be martyred by the time of his parousia, all except for John, as John pointed out in his gospel in, in chapter 21. But here's where Christ says to all of his apostles that they would be martyred. Check out Matthew 24, 9 and following. Then they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Pretty direct, right? In case you missed it, it says they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed. Okay? But watch where he goes with this. Verse 10 and on. He says, At that time, and the time he's referring to is what's often called the tribulation or the birth pains, the time just leading up to the end of the age. He says, At that time, many will fall away and will betray and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Okay, so what Jesus is saying here is that there's going to be a period of apostasy. This period of apostasy coincides with this time when the apostles will be executed one after the other. This is what Jesus says. He says to his apostles, they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed. Okay, and this happens during a period of apostasy. But against this background... Jesus continues, verse 13, But, he says, But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Okay? Wonderful. You'll be saved. Now, he says, The one who perseveres to the end will be saved. What end is he talking about exactly? Because he concludes with this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay? So what's he saying? Because he's talking about the end of the age. He's, is he saying you have to persevere to the end of the age, right? Is he saying that you have to survive until this point, until the end of the age? Would that mean, therefore, that he's saying that everyone, including the apostles themselves, who died before the end, before the day of judgment, would not be saved? Again, is he saying that only those who physically survived till the day of the Lord, like John, because he said John would, is he saying that only these people would be saved? No, of course he's not saying that. That's absurd. When he says, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved, he's pretty much saying exactly the same thing he promises to the churches in Revelation chapter 2. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. He says, to the one who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna. And to the one who overcomes, he also says, and continues in my work until the end, I will give authority over the nations, by the way, that's an interesting one. Maybe we should come back to that one, authority over the nations. We'll come back to that one. But it goes on like this. But I think chapter 2, verse 10 in Revelation is perhaps the best example to make it crystal clear what Jesus meant in Matthew 24 about enduring to the end to be saved. Because in this part of Revelation, he says straight up, Be faithful even unto death, and then I will give you the crown of life. Okay? So that's what it means to persevere to the end. Be faithful to death. Jesus is literally commanding his churches, I mean his lay disciples, in other words, to be faithful unto death, to die for him, right? If if he's commanding lay disciples in, in the seven churches of, of Revelation to die from, how much more so the apostles, the founders of these churches, the leaders of these churches? And this was an explicit prophetic charge that Christ gave to the apostles specifically in Matthew 24, that they would be handed over to be killed, okay? Well, Paul, an apostle, knew he would be included in these numbers, right? He said, am I not an apostle? In 1 Corinthians 9, 1, of course he was an apostle. He's called, he's known throughout history as Paul, St. Paul the Apostle. And Jesus had said to all the apostles, except for John, they will deliver you, you guys over to be persecuted and killed. Okay, Jesus said that all of these things would happen before his parousia. So, Paul knew, he knew, 
he was not going to physically survive until the day of the Lord because of this commandment from Jesus, because of what Jesus said. Now, if he knew he wasn't going to physically survive until the day of the Lord, how on earth could he have written in 1 Thessalonians 4, we who are alive and remain unto the parousia of the Lord, we, as in myself, Paul included, unless he had some other meaning in mind. And indeed, we've already shown that he provided the interpretational keys to this other meaning, a profoundly spiritual meaning at that, in 1 Thessalonians 5. And we've established previously that the spiritual meaning is this, that to be alive is to remain in the parousia, or better translated the presence of the Lord. To be alive is to remain in the presence of the Lord, right? Because God is life. In him is life, and the light is the light of men. Therefore, to be with him is not just to be alive, but because life is the light of men, it also means to be a son of light, right? And a son of the day, etc. All that language ties together in this way. And there's still more to it than this, too. Because to remain in his presence is, in fact, to overcome and to persevere to the end. And this is no suggestion, right? This is a commandment. This is a commandment from Jesus. And let's look at how Jesus himself frames this commandment in John 15 at the Last Supper. Now, this is where he says, Abide in me, and I in you. And that's how the King James Version reads it. Let's go with a more literal translation. This is how Young's literal translation reads. It says, remain in me, and I in you. Abide and remain. They're basically synonyms. Let's read it this way. That way we can catch all of the parallels here, okay? So, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Pause. The fire. So in John 15, Jesus is actually invoking the day of judgment language here. This is an eschatological statement, therefore. Let's continue. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Okay, now listen carefully to what Jesus is about to say here. Next, in my opinion, what he's about to say here sounds a lot like the this isn't a new commandment thing that John was talking about in 1 John, and similarly what Paul was talking about about when he was referring to prior instructions in 1 Thessalonians 4, because this next part that Jesus brings up is about brotherly love. Here's what he says. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. Oh my God, is this beautiful. Don't forget those words. Remain in my love. Remain in my love. That's beautiful. He continues, if you keep my commandments you will remain in my love. Right? That's if then. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Okay. My heart is overflowing when I read these words. This is beautiful. This is the Son of God exhorting us to love. It's so beautiful. Let me catch my breath. Okay, let's think now. Let's back to theology. Let's think about how this relates to Paul's teaching about those who are alive and remain unto his parousia or his presence. Okay? Because, well, I think we just found here in John 15 the source of Paul's teaching. Because, again, as we established at the beginning of this study, Paul's explicit stated purpose for his concluding fourth and fifth chapters of 1 Thessalonians was to ask and encourage them to excel more and more. And in what way? He says, about brotherly love. He spelled this all right out at the beginning of chapter 4. And then, that's when he goes into his discourse about the day of the Lord and his teaching about those who remain in the parousia of the Lord. So the three elements I want to point out here in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 are as follows. 1. Brotherly love. 2. The day of the Lord. 
and three, remaining in the Lord. Well, these three things are exactly what Jesus was talking about in John 15. Brotherly love, the day of the Lord, and remaining in him. Okay, But what takes me aback and blows my mind and fills my heart with reverence and love and fear of God is how Jesus restates his theme of remain in me and remain in my word. He says, remain in my love. Now, isn't that beautiful? I think that's unbelievably beautiful. As he always does, Jesus makes it about love. And so, since John 15 is the source of Paul's teaching in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, so has Paul also made it all about love in imitation of Christ, right? Therefore, what this all reveals to us is the following. The pastoral interpretation of remaining in the presence is to abide in his love, excelling more and more, because this is the pastoral purpose of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, and that is Jesus' commandment, by the way. And also, to remain in the presence, it can find a synonym or a parallel in what Jesus says when he says, remain in my love. You can literally switch presence or parousia with love. To remain in his love is to remain in his parousia. Because this is what it means to persevere to the end, to overcome. Which brings us to the eschatological aspect of this teaching, which is to remain faithful even unto death. To remain faithful, to remain in his word, to remain in his love even unto death. This is what it means to persevere to the end, and therefore to remain unto his parousia. Beautiful. Okay, let's backtrack a bit. Let's take a step back and get a bird's eye view for a second. Let's put some of these pieces together that we've identified over the past few parts of the study. So, one, as we proved earlier in this part, Paul knew he was going to die. And yet he was not concerned that he wouldn't be saved because, two, we've also proven that Christ didn't teach that those who merely survive physically till the day of the Lord would be the only ones saved. Repeat, Christ did not teach that those who merely survive physically till the day of the Lord would be the only ones saved. Jesus did not teach his disciples that they had to survive in the flesh and blood in order to be saved when the Son of Man came in the glory of his kingdom. In fact, we proved in previous parts that three, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. In fact, Jesus taught that the kingdom is comprised of two groups, one being the dead ones whom he would raise and judge, the sleeping ones, the sons of darkness and of the night, right? The other group being living ones who never die, the awake ones, the sons of light and the day, those who we established were born again after the manner described in John 3. Lastly, number four, we established that those who, quote, never died, unquote, in the first century, were in fact the souls beheaded for their testimony of Jesus, described in Revelation 20, who were raised to life in what was called the first resurrection. And this resurrection was not on earth, but in heaven. Therefore, it should now be much clearer that in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul said, we who are alive and remain, he's including himself not because he expects to survive physically until the parousia in his flesh and blood on earth but because he expected to be in heaven a soul beheaded for his testimony of christ a martyr he expected to be a martyr and we have further proof that he knew this to be the case check out his words in second timothy 2 he says the time of my departure is at hand i have fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith now watch what he says next here. Is he about to say, well, too bad I'm about to die, though. I guess I didn't persevere to the end, and I guess I won't get all the stuff Jesus promised to overcomers in Revelation 2. No way. Of course he doesn't say that. He says the opposite. He says, from now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who crave his appearing. So Paul expected his reward not at the moment of death, but on that day, right? That day. The day. And he's talking about the day of the Lord. This is the same thing that he teaches in 1 Thessalonians 4. That as for those who endure till death, who die as faithful witnesses, they will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. But in fact, only after the resurrection of those who are asleep, Again, the resurrection of the children of darkness, children of the night. Only after this resurrection would Paul, 
and the faithful receive their reward. And this, my friends, is the moment, is the twinkling of the eye, which is often called the rapture. This is when, finally, as Paul says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, wait a minute. This is the moment of truth, right? This is the rapture moment. But hold on. If we've already so firmly established that we who are alive and remain, that statement refers to those who, like Paul, were faithful witnesses who endured to the end, that is, they were martyrs killed for Christ, whose souls were up in heaven, up in heaven, that we must ask ourselves, when these people are being caught up together with the resurrected sleepers in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, in which direction are Paul and his folk going? Which direction are they going? Right? If, if their souls are in heaven, which direction are they going? Okay, the answer is the opposite of how the modern rapture teaching is traditionally illustrated. Because the answer is not that we who are alive and remain are going up. The answer is we are alive and remain, they were going down. We who are alive and remain, etc. Are the thousands of holy ones described by Enoch in his prophecy, quoted by Jude. These are the holy ones with whom... The Son of Man would be coming on the clouds with great power and glory, okay? That's Paul. That's the people whose souls were beheaded for Christ, right? He said, will we not judge angels? And indeed, they are coming with Christ as he judges. Now, the modern rapture teaching, which again is barely, barely a, a couple, a few hundred years old, it says that those who are alive and remain refers to those who physically survive until a parousia which they teach is yet to come, and that this group of people, being on earth, are lifted up bodily to meet the Lord in the air. Well, surely no one has seen such a thing take place yet, right? Which is one of the main reasons why they say that this parousia has yet to come, even though Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, correctly predicted several times, in several ways, that the day of the Lord would come upon his own generation. Not only this, but the modern rapture scheme completely inverts what Paul is describing. Paul is saying that it is the dead in Christ who are first to rise. To rise. They're the ones who rise. While we who are alive are in the presence of the Lord. Well, what's the Lord doing? He's descending. So therefore, we who are alive, they must necessarily, if they're with him, they got to be descending with him. Okay? When you see this in 1 Thessalonians 4, you can't unsee it. The modern rapture doctrine completely reverses it, but it makes no sense that way. The text explicitly says that the we who are alive group is with Christ who is descending. Therefore, they are descending with him. Conversely, it explicitly states that the other group, the dead, the sleeping ones, they're the ones who are ascending. Okay? Okay, now, what exactly it means when the dead ascend or when they rise we'll be getting that into the next part and the parts to come this like i said is going to be a very juicy study and there's there's actually a lot more that we can get from first thessalonians 4 and 5 and i look forward to getting more into it in the coming days and weeks thank you so much for listening again please like and subscribe and uh, hit the notifications if you made it this far i think you probably are into this this is such a fascinating topic, and it's been really fun so far, and I look forward to everything that we're going to learn together over the coming days and weeks. God bless you. Talk soon.